Dear friends, thank you very much for taking part in today's event organized by Armenian Relief Society in partnership with the Commission of Armenia to the United Nations on the margin of the 63rd session of the Commission on Status of Women. Uh, around 280 uh, side events and 400 par parallel events are taking place this year during the two-week session of CSW. Uh, that demonstrates the incredible interest towards issues of equality, inclusion, and protection of women, not only on the part of the member states and UN institutions, but also from various civil societies and organizations, networks, and communities with diverse views, interests, and agendas. There is a common understanding that protection of women's rights is as relevant as ever for human development and progress, regardless of political and cultural peculiarities of individual member states and societies. Today, women's issues are strongly integrated within the three pillars of the United Nations, peace and security, human rights, and development. This year's priority theme for CSW social protection system, access to public services and sustainable infrastructure for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls tackles a wide range of development sectors that are crucial, crucial for building resilient and prosperous societies. The recent report of the Secretary General on priority theme we confirms <coughs> strong linkages and the independence of social protection public services and sustainable infrastructure, as well as the need to integrate the gender perspective in designing and implementing policies in these areas. Uh, as Armenia will be assuming its membership in the Commission on Status of Women from the 64th session, we are particularly happy that this year the delegation of Armenia is headed by the Minister of Labor and Social Affairs Ms. Zawi Batan, who represents the new generation of Armenian decision makers with an extensive background in advocacy for human rights, inclusion, and equal opportunities. And we'll be having a side event organized by Mission of Armenia in partnership with UN Women and UNFPA tomorrow at uh, 4.30, and I will encourage you to take part participation there as well. Um, Armenia is convinced that uh, strong human rights institutions, rule of law, and genuine participatory democracy are also crucial prerequisites for equal opportunities and economic empowerment of women. Uh, the program of government adopted last month pays particular attention to expansion of economic opportunities for women as well as creating conducive environment for equal rights and equal opportunities. More targeted programs regulating state employment policy will be further developed. The main goal of th in this area is to increase the unemployment rate and make young people, women, and people with disabilities more competitive in the labor market. Uh, dear friends, I'm pleased uh, to sit today together amongst the panelists with the Armenian Relief Society, one, one of the 
all these Armenian humanitarian organizations, also the representatives of Armenia <coughs> Fund, which has a, a vast experience in infrastructure projects and also distinguished expert for, from the World Bank. This is a good uh, opportunity to hear analysis and policy advice on infrastructure development and interlinked roles of public and private sectors in this area and how interventions from the financial institutions may bring about sustainable and long-lasting <laughs> solutions in the area of so social protection and uh, gender equality. Uh, once again, let me uh, thank all our panelists for joining the discussion today and I wish all you productive deliberations. Thank you.
I gave a challenge to present global experience in 10 minutes, but I also wanted to link it to our, the situation in Armenia, so you will hear me to give you a lot of statistics on the issues that we face in Armenia, which I think is important to start voicing because we have a unique opportunity right now with the new parliament and with new government and with the new minister who is keen to address these issues. So I am actually looking forward to being in the event with the minister tomorrow. So, uh, you know, being from the World Bank, let me start with saying something that you probably would all expect me to say, that gender inequality and persistent gaps between men and women are critical for countries' economic growth. Numerous studies, including one from the World Bank that actually is titled Unrealized Potential, the uh, High Cost of Gender Inequality in Earnings, have estimated that if women employment equal men, economies would be more resilient, economic growth would be higher, and right now the losses in 141 countries that have been included in the study are 160 trillion of GDP. In Armenia, the loss of economic output due to this issue of uh, women um, uh, exclusion from economic opportunities equal, is equivalent of 14% of GDP. This is just the numbers to set the stage. So, being a, an institution that very much actually cares about economic uh, growth and inclusion and, and, and um, e equality, uh, we have developed a, a, a strategy for gender equality. Actually, look at, uh, think about it. It's not just a gender strategy, it's gender equality strategy. So, sorry, why is it moving? Um, so, the strategy has four pillars. Uh, first pillar is about improved uh, human endowment and human capital. The second one is about removing constraints to more and better jobs. And th the third one is removing uh, barriers to ownership of the assets and access to finance. And finally, enhancing women's uh, voice and agency and engaging men in uh, the, uh, changing social norms addressing the issue of early marriages and gender uh, roles and violence. The, so uh, this is a global strategy. Then we uh, focus on social protection issues, and social protection actually can contribute in significant ways in all four pillars of the strategy. I need to remember how to use it. Okay, yeah. The social insurance, social safety nets, social assistance, labor and jobs and skills and leading to the employment. So the outcomes that we want to achieve with all these include, as I said, human capital, economic opportunities, and voice and agency. Let me unpack each of these outcomes and what do we mean. So look at the human capital, uh, and it, uh, we, we take a measure of education attainment. Across regions, you will see with exception of Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East and North Africa, women are actually gaining access to education and in many countries have surpassed men in educational attain attainment. Such as in the case in Armenia, you see the first column is Armenia. In Armenia, uh, we have uh, estimated 1.5 women in tertiary education for every man. But what do we do with it? The economic opportunity, yeah, is that the education has to translate into the economic opportunity. And women represent a great asset for countries and potent, are potential for economic growth, as I actually mentioned at the beginning. However, their participation in the labor force has, has remains very limited. Globally, it's 49%. In Armenia, only 52%, which is compared to uh, the East, uh, East Asia and um, in uh, East Europe countries, is much uh, lower than in the comparable by income and development <coughs> level countries, uh, such as, uh, for example, in Indonesia, is higher. 
Then when you take two of these things, uh, education and unemployment, and look at this, it, it, you will see that despite the access to higher education uh, opportun opportunities, some of the economies, including in Armenia, do not fully benefit from the investment made, made in the women's education. Unemployment rates are much higher among women uh, than men. Uh, formal unemployment for women is 9.5%, but it goes much higher for girls up to 30. So they go to higher education, but then they, they take longer breaks. And when they take longer breaks, and we know why young women take longer breaks, and I will uh, demonstrate there later what we can do about it, they also uh, have a, 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 a more difficulty to restart after they take the break. In addition to that, women tend to work in less paying sectors, such as public sector, education, health. And that's this segregation, by definition, leads them to enter the higher education in these sectors and therefore be set for it for life. And we have much less um, uh, uh, limited number of girls entering STEM education, STEM standing for science, uh, technology, uh, engineering, and maths. In this field, we have very uh, uh, low numbers, which in turn, okay, leads to the, the issue of the li livelihoods, and I also wanted to talk about legal protection. In the World Bank, we have recently launched a study that is called Women, Business, uh, Women, Business, and Law. This is a report that studies all the economies in the world and looks at the progress that countries have made in legal rights of the women. And, and looks at the 10-year, uh, decade-long data to understand what has been the progress. There has been a progress. However, despite that progress, only 70, uh, uh, women are actually only accorded 75% of legal rights of the men, that of the men, yeah? In Armenia, the index that stands at 83%. So, you ask what are the key areas, because we, we tend to think that our legal system is perfect, but when you unpack it by the criteria that is used in this index, you will see we lag behind in, we have absence of domestic violence legislation, absence of criminal penalties or civil remedies for sexual harassment in employment. We have no law mandating equal remuneration for working of equal value. Women earn on average 33% less than men in Armenia. We also have absence of paid paternity or parental leave for that matter. And there is no law that prohibits gender discrimination by creditors and banks. Then we go next. So we look at the agency and government participation. Women are gaining access to the levels of power all over the world. And, but, but still lagging behind in most, most, most developing regions and actually hold minority seats in parliament. Uh, I think the, the global average for uh, uh, the, the parla uh, par parliament, uh, female participation in, in parliament, it's about 22%. In Armenia, we're doing better, and actually with the new parliament that, uh, that was elected in December, we're doing much better, it's 23%, up for 18% from the last parliament, previous parliament, but we are still nowhere at the 1990 level, which was 35%, and we're doing much worse, much worse, than in other countries of our comparable level of development and economic, uh, in the economic status. The, all this actually leads us to, uh, in addition in Armenia, one more issue that we, uh, we need to acknowledge is the vulnerability uh, uh, that affects disproportionately women. And disproportionately women are le poorer than men. Mm -hmm. Poverty is a big issue in Armenia, as we all well know. 
worldwide, just give you a figure, worldwide, for every 104 women, for every 100 men, 104 women are in poverty, yeah? In Armenia, the, the, that proportion stands at, for every 100 men, we have 117 poor women. And percentage of female-headed households is quite high. Uh, above the average for the countries with similar income level, with pro uh, we have higher proportion of female-headed uh, households. We know the, the reason. It can be explained by sizable out-migration and differences in life expectancy by gender, but still, we need to do something. So, what do we do in social protection? Okay. There are several things that one can do in social protection. Let me first explain that everybody needs social protection in their life. Throughout the life cycle, we all need to have access to so some sort of social protection. We need to have healthy mothers, for which we need to have maternity benefits. We need well-nourished and healthy children, for which we need child benefits and child care. We need education, young members of society, so need scholarships. We need skilled labor ready for new types of jobs because the job market is now also challenged by the technological advances. And we need a labor force that is ready for this. So for that, social protection can provide active labor market program, reskilling and retooling labor force. And finally, we all need a dignified life when we retire. We need the decent pensions, we need age care. And right now, not all of these that are part of social protection as a package are available. Particularly for female labor, uh, labor force participation, access to quality child care and elderly care is very big barrier for the, the economic participation of, of women. Because women are like, uh, more likely than men to bear child care responsibility, especially that we don't have a paternal or paternity leave, leave policy, as well as care for their aging parents. In Armenia, only 14% children attend kindergarten or any other child care services in rural Armenia. 24% in secondary cities, and only 33% in Yerevan. You would think in Yerevan everybody should go to kindergarten and have an access, but that's not the case. And not only the access is an issue, lack of infrastructure is an issue, but also uh, the, the, the cost of the, the child care is a big issue. So globally, we're all challenged the world is challenged, that social protection has big role to play. However, it doesn't have adequate coverage, especially in low-income countries. Globally, only 44% of population of the world have any form of social protection, and only 56% of, uh, of poor population have any form of social protection. We have slightly better picture in, in social protection coverage in Armenia, where 60% of population <coughs> has some form of access to social, uh, some access to some form of social protection. However, only 73% of poor have it. And now, family poverty benefit that many of the poor families get is very low coverage at 14%, and only 35% uh, of poor get it. So, which means that we have a lot of uh, things to do there and big agenda for access of poor by uh, social protection. In addition, we're challenged by the large informal sector. People are not working in the uh, formally paid jobs to, uh, to, uh, which are linked to some social uh, protection or social insurance. If you look at the global number, 80% of labor markets in developing countries are actually engaged in uh, informal sector activities with no or little access to social protection. In Armenia, according to the Armstrong Labor Force Service, 46.6% point of population works in informal sector and is not covered by social protection. That's a challenge. <coughs> so, but what can we do? We have, it, Tremendous opportunity right now, as I mentioned already. It's absolutely essential.
crucial that we do it now. If we don't do it now, we're gonna lose the momentum, we're gonna lose the excitement of this momentum. So we, we, we have the lifetime opportunity to develop a society that would provide equal opportunities for all. And the new parliament and new government program has that commitment. They need to continue legal reforms, promote value of girls, or, and um, improve equality in leadership roles. Value of growth, and that starts even before they are born, as you know. A big issue, the selective, uh, uh, gender selective birth in Armenia, as you know, is an issue. Supports women entrepreneurship and workforce participation. Supports STEM education for growth, and ad adopt paternity parental leave policies and finally, improve access to quality early education, child care program, and establish a decent health elder care system that would allow women to participate in the labor market. So finally, the World Bank. What does the World Bank do? As I mentioned, and we work with uh, hundreds of countries in the world, but we also work in Armenia, and we have a big program in Armenia. Right now, Armenia is part of the Human Capital Project, uh, uh, where we look into <laughs> issues of the early uh, survival to uh, age five uh, and uh, expecting years of schooling, learning outcomes, and also adult survival rate to, uh, to determine the productivity of today's uh, kids for the future labor market. So Armenia is part of that project and we are very happy to work. We also have um, the Women Entrepreneur Finance Initiative, which mobilized about 340 million to invest in projects that support women-led businesses and work with the government to address legal and regulatory barriers that stifle women entrepreneurs. So we're ready to work with the government in all these dimensions so that we can uh, close the gap between men and women in Armenia and finally reach the gender equality in Armenia by 2030, I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I hope you all are coming up with your questions as we go along. But um, um, we're now very interested in examining the transition and relationship between social protection systems and now the development of infrastructure. So Ms. Mehanyan will discuss with us the role of infrastructure in gender equality. She's a managing partner and chief financial officer of Cordoba Corporation, a California-based full-service engineering construction management program man, firm specializing in the delivery of infrastructure projects in transportation, water, energy, and education sectors. Ms. Mehanyan serves in leadership positions for several educational institutions and nonprofit organizations. She is the vice chair of the board of trustees at Woodbury University, is a member of the Dean's Leadership Board at Cal Poly Pomona College of Engineering and is a member of the Board of Trustees at Southwestern Law School. In addition, she is the International Chairperson of All Armenia Fund Incorporated, which has raised more than $120 million for humanitarian aid and infrastructure development in Armenia. We will now show a video depicting some of... You want to first? Okay. This is my <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We moved the seats not to take the seat of the ambassador, <laughs> but to clear the screen so you all can see the next presentation. Um, thank you, thank you for being here. And I would like to thank um, the Armenian Relief Society for organizing this event and the whole is here that every year come here and do this. We appreciate what you do. This is this is great work. And I know how much how much effort goes into this. Thank you. Thank you everyone for this. Um, the history of infrastructure parallels that of human progress. It is as true today in the Republic of Armenia as it was when the Romans built the first aqueduct in the city of Roma in 312 BC. Armenia Fund is a global organization that partners with the Armenian diaspora to develop and implement large-scale infrastructure projects. Since its formation in 1994, it has constructed national highways, uh, major water distribution and irrigation systems, hospitals, schools, community, and service delivery centers. 
A significant component of the fund's contribution is allocated to agricultural projects, bringing vital assistance to the people of Armenia. Uh, according to the data from the Gates Foundation, women are often the prime engines of sustained economic growth in developing and underdeveloped nations. In the Republic of Armenia, agriculture employs approximately 45% of workforce, and almost half of these workforce are women. Farmers from small and remote villages are highly vulnerable to poverty and increasingly harsh weather conditions created by global warming, climate change. A key issue tied to women's poverty in Armenia is out-migration, as you just mentioned, due to Armenia's weak labor market and lack of <coughs> new developed infrastructure. Uh, some, about 40,000 Armenian working age men migrate annually for seasonal labor to Russia and beyond. Remittances made up 18% of gross domestic product in 2014, 40% of Armenians rely on this transfer as their basic income. While traveling through the border villages of Armenia, one cannot miss the absence of working age men in the fields, in the community centers, in the social life. With men gone, women and children stay behind and work to secure household income to pay for basic necessities. We have learned firsthand that specific infrastructure programs targeted to women have large multiplier effect that ripples across economies. And I want to tell you about this incredible encounter. <coughs> I want to give you some good news. Uh, meet Karine Mugarchian in the village of Pachartsa in northern Armenia. Four years ago, Armenia Fund built a 100 square feet, uh, 100 square meter greenhouse for her to grow car car crops year round. She's now the most successful farmer in Khajarzan. No one harvests more cucumbers per year than Garine. A ton or more annually that she, that she, so, uh, she provides to the suppliers and resellers. Just the cucumber's income allow her to make a living. The Armenia Fund has since built nine more greenhouses in the area in Khachatsan. Almost every one of them is managed by women and sustained by women. We know more greenhouses means more wealth in the villages and improved lives for girls and young women. As the agricultural economy boomed in Bahush this past decade <coughs> with newly constructed irrigation systems and these greenhouses, <coughs> Armenian Fund built schools for a growing population of children and young women in the region. We know that the digital divide is not just a problem of rich and poor nations, it's a gender issue. Most of four billion people currently offline are in poor rural areas of the world are women and girls. If young girls in Armenia are going to grow up to be successful young women, they need tools to compete in the digital global world and economy. Armenia Fund equipped every school in Davos with modern information technology connected to internet. If we plan and build accordingly, the daughters of the farmers will become the future leaders of Armenia and beyond. And I would like to leave you with a thought from Eleanor Roosevelt. Women know that life must go on and the needs of, the li of life must be met. And it is their courage and their determination which time and time again have pulled us through. I would like now to watch a little video for all of you that is a testament to the same. The Tabush region is a major source of water for Armenia. However, a decade ago, farmland was often dry, 
due to lack of irrigation technology. Without the ability to farm, residents fled to make a living elsewhere. Women and children were often left behind. To remedy the situation, the Armenia Fund built wells, canals, and vital irrigation systems to supply water to farmland and villages throughout the region. Today, most of the farmland in the area is connected to the newly built irrigation network. In these fields, water is stored in local reservoirs and distributed to crops through drip irrigation systems. Agricultural yields have greatly increased in the past decade, and incomes and employment have risen steadily across the region. In the town of Ditivan, 90% of the land is now being farmed, up from 25% just a decade ago. What was once brown is now green with abundance. The construction of greenhouses has greatly improved the lives of women in Armenia. Each greenhouse built by the Armenia Fund is 100 square meters in size and is equipped with an irrigation system. Greenhouses allow for farming year-round, despite climate, providing bountiful harvests that can be sold in the marketplace. A single productive greenhouse can provide a living to a village household and is creating a new class of women entrepreneurs. Success builds upon success. With the advent of water technology and distribution, local incomes and employment have grown with rising agricultural production. Armenia Fund has built new schools to cater to the growing population of school-aged children. These schools offer a world-class education to young women. <clears throat> Armenia Fund installed network computer systems to all 72 schools in the Tabush province. 7,000 students in the region now have access to modern information technology. To quote a school principal in Tabush, as we live in a digital age, computers and the internet are just as important as air and water is to crops. Every step of infrastructure development and implementation is a bright new chapter for women in Armenia. Greek, from Greece, where 
it says that every individual has the right to include themselves in the governance of, of, of a country, and therefore that is how we will have a true democracy. Today we look at civil society in a different way. We look at how civil society can do things through organized organizations as the third sector, and this is where it comes in. Um, I'm going to be presenting a historical overview of what the Armenian Relief Society has done. For those of you that do not know, the Armenian Relief Society has entered its 109th year. Wow. We are an organization that was founded in New York in one of the first Armenian diasporas. <clears throat> and we have gone through two world wars. We have gone through earthquakes. We have gone through genocide. And we have still survived because we must be doing, I'm going to toot our own horn, something right. <laughs> But the most amazing thing about the Armenian Relief Society isn't the amount of years that we've had. It's the fact that our organization is run and membered by women. So our entire community is based on women. And I'm going to tell World Bank that as long as Armenia Fund and organizations like the Armenian Relief Society are here, we will help in hand with government regardless of what government, to make Armenia a better place. So, the earthquake in Svidak, which just, we just commemorated its 30th year, and why is it important? Because the earthquake regions, or the cities that were part of the earthquake, are still in need of development. So I wanted to take everyone back down a 30-year memory to show you what the ARS has done in infrastructure, in social protection, public service, while partnering with government. Because it's important to partner with government. As an NGO, you cannot come in from the outside and look at what society needs without talking to government officials in that area. Because after all, when the government is on your side and helping you, it makes your life easier to actually realize and bring a project to fruition. So the earthquake was on December 7, 1988. Numbers have varied of how many people were killed from 30,000 to 50,000. But the latest concrete number we've seen is nearly 40,000. There were over 130,000 injured. There were three major cities greatly affected and still are in, who are still in need of further development. And there were villages destroyed. So what did the Armenian Relief Society do? Well, considering this was our first, not our first major natural disaster or man-made disaster, uh, we took the action in three priorities. Prevent deaths, because there wasn't enough medical equipment, and as an ex-Soviet satellite state, I would like to say that the Soviet Union did everything in its power to refuse help from the outside, including not giving members of our organization or other organizations, visas. They advertised that they did. They didn't. Um, they closed down medical intervention and instruments. They did not allow us to send them. But we eventually got in through different pressures, through different governments, as well as the government of Armenia, who was part of the uh, ex-Soviet Union. We tried get guaranteeing uh, medical attention to survivors. and reactivated, tried to reactivate pre-disaster conditions. So it's, the ARS's initial response in the first week was send trauma specialists to Armenia as soon as possible. Create the beauty, create a volunteer donor corps, which is the beauty of the ARS. There are organizations who cannot say they're grassroots organizations, but the Armenian Relief Society is one of those grassroots organizations were founded in 27 countries with 222 chapters, uh, with nearly 15,000 members across the world. So we, we created special search and rescue teams with the equipment, about $15,000 worth, and we sent specialists to Armenia to, to search the zone because there were survivors buried for days. Um, here I want to talk about an interesting thing. There was a mother, since we're talking about empowerment of women, and how women can empower themselves. 
There was a mother with a six-month-old baby who was buried under the rubble in Gyumri. And this woman survived for six weeks with her baby. Um, she came to, she came to because she heard the noise of a tractor or some sort of equipment trying to clean, to destroy, roll over the rubble she was buried under. And she had no food. But her child survived. Her six month old baby survived. And her six month old baby survived because she cut her arms in the rock and she fed her her blood. Now, the interesting thing is that this mother and daughter received aid from the Armenian Relief Society weeks later, if not days later, while they were in the hospital, we received visits and so forth. I'm happy to say that both mother and daughter live a healthy life in the city of Gyumri today, and they've stayed in the country because of the support that our organization has been able to provide in the beginning stages. So, just to touch up on a few things that we've done while during the earthquake. We have spent, um, we have built villages. We've built 187 homes throughout the entire earthquake area. We brought people to the United States to train them. And I'm happy to say that one of those young men who was brought to Los Angeles to be trained in the medical field is on, is employed at our mother and child birthing center, which was founded by the East Coast, which I will touch upon. Um, We've created a mother's fund in that area because what happened is a lot of the men were either deceased or had to leave because they were living in rubble and had to go work just like my colleague said. But we created a lonely mother's fund where we supported these women as much as possible financially so that they can li continue living and co come back to their regular state. When it comes to partnering with governments, we received nearly $800,000 from the U.S. government through USIID to retrain physicians and nurses. And we added almost, we added $397,000 and plus through different donations, because we solely focus on donations, we, we spent almost $2 million training the staff, physical, uh, medical staff of Armenia in those days. <coughs> so. Between 1992 and 1994, the ARS raised and spent nearly $20 million in Armenia, which today's valuation is roughly $44 million. We built 187 homes. We built schools in six villages. We put infrastructure in. And now we're going to come on, move on to social protection and, so, and public service. So, in 1992, we sent 1,000 tons of powdered milk to hospitals to ensure nutrition for mothers and newborns. In 95, we created a wool program where 130 women were given the wool and the opportunity to work and the training to knit if they were unaware of doing it, which is hardly not seen in an Armenian family. And they were also given the opportunity to sell their work. Uh, in 1996, as Maria mentioned, agriculture is really big. We provided vegetable seeds. And Maria, the interesting thing is the Armenia, uh, our Armenia Fund and ARS have done uh, greenhouses. We've actually partnered with UNDP in the last years to build close to 96 greenhouses in the uh, Davushmars. So we just, we just need to keep pushing forward. We've partnered with World Vision and gave uh, women sewing machines. Water is the most important thing for survival. We built a five kilometer, kilometer long aqueduct in the Arjut village so that uh, the farmers could have clean water. And this was done through with, with partnership with the UN Nourishment Program Council. So I'm just jumping forward to modern times now. In 1998, the Armenian Relief Society established a chain of Sose kindergartens because there was the need for it. And with these Sose kindergartens, we gave children a free education. We employed 72 staff, all who were women. Um, we renovated and reconstructed a modern kindergarten 
which is three stories and has a bunker underneath just in case it needs it and is earthquake proof and everything. Um, we partner with the government as they give us funding per child and they, pay, they help pay our teacher salaries because the budgeting is quite large and it's very difficult to keep track of. We, went, we grew to 11 kindergartens and we have proudly turned over five to the government saying that they're self-sustainable now and the government can continue on the great work that it needs to. So this is one way that government and, NG, and NGOs can partner together by making for the better good. And so I already went through this. Let's go to one of my favorite projects. It's the Ahuria Mother and Child Birthing Clinic. It honestly is one of my favorite projects because it was the first hospital that was opened up in the earthquake region in 1997. And I've got the numbers for you. It was founded by the ARS East Coast and eventually taken over by the ARS Central Executive Board and is now supported by our entities worldwide. Till, to this date, we've had over 14,410 total births. And we encourage the births of second and third female daughters for families in that region. The, the thing that makes me the proudest is we have a zero mortality rate. Wow. And I'm proud, I proudly, I want to keep saying that every year proudly, because I don't want to come back the following year and say that we had the death. And that really makes me proud. And the beauty of this is once again, NGO and government partner together because Armenia's government is one of the governments where it helps with childbirth and it helps with birth services and it helps with child rearing. We also partner with UNFPA and UNICEF when it comes to educating and training. UNICEF with when it comes to um, vaccinations. So I wanted just to show you that our birthing center, free of charge, we take no money from any patient that comes prenatal, postnatal, birth natal, and we've now added an MRI machine, uh, and it's all free of charge. I wanted to show you that in the Shirag Mars, 33% of the births of 3671 in 2015 were happened at our center. So out of the 13,278 births in the total province, we have, we have catered to 4,783 of those. And we treat Rough, we've already treated in its short history 160,000 patients at the center, plus about 8,000 house visits and so forth. So this is, I want to end on a positive note. When civil society and government work hand in hand, all we can do is improve life around us. And it's, it, it's important what you put in. If you believe in something, it will succeed. If you believe in something, when government doesn't want to work with you, knock on that door and they will work with you. Because they want to improve their country. There is no government, politically speaking, that wants to be hated by their own people. Thank you. But you're not paid for it. But 
generally the uh, in Armenia the informal workforce is when you work uh, without a contract and you're paid cash and are not paid by any formal means. What that means, in fact, that you're not enrolled in social insurance programs, you're not enrolled in any medical insurance, health insurance program, and uh, you actually uh, have no uh, rights that other workers have. For example, maternity benefits, or whatever benefits, yeah? And uh, the problem with, uh, uh, with that is that you, you basically, your work is not visible, and therefore you also lose the ability to hear improve your skills to go to a higher paying job or to a better quality job. So it's on the worker side. On the employer side, the taxes oftentimes make it uh, difficult, not difficult, but make it undesirable for the employer to give you a formal contract because then they have to pay your social security company matching uh, bill. They also have to enroll you in health insurance, etc., etc. So the the solution to that is twofold. Again, first. Yes, we should encourage formal contract between workers and employers. We should. Through taxation and other incentives to the employers to employ these people more formally. But we also have to have some means for allowing the informal workers to participate in social protection programs to enroll on voluntary basis, for example, into social insurance or health insurance and pay their contribution and uh, so that they can access these services. So, so there have been many attempts by ILO in particular to make the informal workers to go into the formal work. But as I mentioned the numbers, we, in 40 years we haven't succeeded. So that means that we need to delink the social protection from the employment so that everybody can have, have an access. I'll just talk about the, infra I mean, good infrastructure generally provides good life conditions for all genders. However, um, a very targeted way of developing infrastructure can be beneficial to a gender, in this case, women. And there's two ways of this. One is to absorb. Women are going to work on the farms no matter what, mm -hmm. as a part of their family contribution to their business and to their and life. And not pay for it. And not pay for it. <laughs> Could you create a certain kind of infrastructure that targets women and gives them the opportunity to be paid for the services that they provide? The so there's two kinds. So one is to absorb what's there because they're already doing it and one if we're very sophisticated to create even the the need let's say the work that is not there but you can create for women in the in the village and we'll now be taking questions from the audience we'll take a couple um you can just write down some responses and then you all can respond <coughs> in whatever order to whatever you want so Take a few questions now and yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Veronica and I'm from Girl Scouts USA. Um, and I was wondering, how do you plan to encourage girls to pursue STEM careers and seek leadership opportunities instead of social and public sectors? And what has been most effective in doing this? And how do you hope to encourage girls to seek better opportunities? Uh, 
I'm God and I'm not from Girl Scouts USA. <laughs> um, mine's a kind of bottom up question because we've really been talking about top down. Um, from all the research and personal knowledge that I have, Armenia is a very collectivist culture country that is very not trusting of outside ideas and mindsets coming in and especially certain things that are deemed as women's issues are backseated or not taken as seriously. Like your example with Greece, you know, every every person has equal footing. Well, it's like every landowning male of a certain age. And for us in Armenia, it feels like no matter what we do, at the end of the day, it only matters how good of a mother can we be and how good of a wife can we be to support. So how, what are the plans from these wonderful organizations to kind of inject a bottom up approach and show that a woman's respect shouldn't be delineated to just her mother role and her wife role. Thank you, and then do you have one more question? Um, I have a follow-up question for the original question there. What are these organizations doing to help the government empower and advance all these social activities or to, to enable women to be more productive? None of these are easy or straightforward questions, but uh, I encourage you all to share your ideas with us. Okay. Uh, so the first question was actually the first and the second question. No, the first question was about STEM, yeah? Mm -hmm and how to encourage. That's not the easiest uh, uh, question, to be honest with you. By the way, just for information, I am graduate of Yerevan Polytechnic Institute. Oh. <laughs> That's STEM for me. Yeah. <laughs> My first back, uh, in, background is in uh, construction engineering and architecture, the undergrad. And then I have done the economics after that. And how many women were in your class? Uh, by the way, and uh, also for your information, I graduated 38 years ago. So there were very few men, uh, girls in our class. So, but I do see uh, increased interest uh, uh, in, in, um, in uh, the math and science and engineering in Armenia. It's a matter of actually uh, promoting it through different policies. As I said, unless you actually make policies and conditions conducive for easy and re-entering into the labor market, easy access to different um, productive opportunities, people, uh, uh, women will, will take it up. They don't, they buy by default going to the social sciences because these are easier for them to re-enter and uh, get the jobs. So that's one, but so I think the policies matter, so we need to have the flexible policies that would easily allow in and out of the labor market. And, but we also need role models. And role models matter. As I was talking about parliament, for example, we only have 23%. No offense, but look at the newly appointed government. We have one minister who is and that minister in the, is in the traditional ministries. All the ministries of social affairs around the world are female. So we're no exception and we're not unique. Mm -hmm. Where is our minister of finance female? You know how many economists we have? We have a lot of economists, but we don't have the minister of finance for a female, uh, who is female. Uh, the community and uh, um, the center such as Tumo Mentor. And I'm very happy that Tumo is now, everybody knows what Tumo is, yeah? Mm -hmm. That Tumo is opening uh, the, the center in Taushmars in mm -hmm. Koch Village. 
that is going to encourage girls in the town smarts to go to, to, to learn the computer science. So I think it cannot be just one thing. It has to be a combination of policies and programs starting from the early years, early education in the kindergarten. But we always go for, okay, oh, this is a girl that, somebody mentioned the social norm. The social norm has to change. Because when I was going to engineering school, my entire family was crying. <laughs> my father wanted me to go to medical school. I was like, no, I'm not going to medical school. So there is this social norm that these are not female professions. I'm sorry to say, but I don't think I'm a failure. I think I have succeeded something <laughs> in my life by going through the engineering school. Because that's the school that actually sets you a certain uh, mindset that actually takes you places. Anyway, so I think it's a combination of different policies, programs, and changing the social norm. I don't know if that addresses your second question um, uh, about uh, the, the social service. I, I did not quite catch your, your question. But I think it's a big issue that we get the social norm and how to break that social norm, how to change that social norm so we are not viewed as uh, girls are for these professions or girls only do this. That needs to change. I think there was a, a part of this question was that if, if there's a matrix for evaluating the efficiency of the programs that are implemented, which I think is an essential question. How do you, how do you evaluate how good your program works. Like, uh, sure. For example, uh, how would you how, how, uh, you evaluate this program against certain set of uh, outcomes? Yeah, as I was saying, mm -hmm. saying. So, how many women are entrepreneur you have? Uh, entrepreneurs you have? Like you evaluating your greenhouses by how much money? I mean, how much earnings they have so that actually they can sustain or make a profit or enlarge their business. There are multiple, there are multiple uh, ways of uh, evaluating it, but you need to have two things. You have to get your baseline, where you're starting, and where you have to have your objective, where you're going, and then if you have that, you can measure. And I'm happy to talk details because I don't know, there's so many indicators that you can develop to, to measure this. But labor force participation, women labor force participation is one indicator that we actually need to do something about in Armenia. Women just don't work simply because they don't earn enough to pay for childcare and, and they, they take long breaks just because it's better to sit at home. More beneficial economically to sit at home to watch your child rather than hire nanny or take them to the kindergarten that often they have no access to. I'd like to um, touch on the uh, bottoms-up approach that you brought up. The bottoms-up approach. I, I totally understand this issue that you're bringing up. I do think it's a long-term effort because it's a part of the education, culture, arts. Think about it. You travel around the world the most important cities, you see these huge, humongous statues of heroes and mo role models. They're all men. <laughs> How many women statues have you ever seen in Rome, Paris, I don't know, Prague, <laughs> New York, Boston? I mean, this is, I think, an issue that the entire world now deals with. And I'm hoping that it's the issue that is the next, you know, the, lady, I mean, the next 10 years, decade, the next 10 years should be addressed because it's a part of the culture, the education, but, but also it's a part of, it's, the statues tell a story, right? So there's not maybe enough stories of women heroes, or they're not told. I was in, a, in Los Angeles, I went to a um, art exhibit of women painters in the US in 30s and 40s that are signed by men's name. They wow. painted and they signed their men's name. Wow. So, you know, this is, an issue that I think we all deal with, and I'm glad that today we're all here, and conferences like this become more and more important because the issue of women becomes globally an issue as, as the gender inequality. So I wish that there was an answer that, you know, we can do this faster, 
I think there's still the, the developed world is dealing with it, the entire Europe, the Western world. I think it's going to be take time, and, and we all have to play a part. I wish there was easier and, and, and faster. I, have a, oh, I, have a, I just want to touch upon one other thing, adding to, adding to Maria and Anush. When it comes to Armenian women and stereotypes, and our communities and our households, I think, I look around and all I see is strong women around us. Yes, there are those that are weaker, but it is us women in all walks of life, whether we are Armenian or not Armenian, who need to stand up and say, you know what, this is what we want and we're going to take it. And I'm, I'm not being posit positive, I'm not being some in, in some fantasy, but this is the reality. Women wanted to vote, they took it. Countries like the United States, which we sit in, that is this country there with freedom of rights, privacy, was one of the later countries that gave the United, women in the United States the right to vote. New Zealand was the first. Armenia was, was second or third in 1918. And it happened without a fight. It is the 70 years of the Soviet Union that changed our, our social culture. And it is that 70 years that caused women to go backwards in society. Because if you look at the history of Armenia, we may not have had statues, but we had gods that were women, and we, we looked up to them. And we had queens. I mean, let's be honest. 301 AD, we all throw it around saying we were the first Christian nation. But if it wasn't for a woman, Derta Takabor would never have gotten Grigor Dusavorich out of His sister was the one. His sister was the one that pushed him to get Grigor Dusavorich out of Korvira. So it is historically we have been a female dominant culture, and it's just we need to educate the new generations who have not been born under the Iron Curtain to come back to that. There was one last question that uh, was talking about uh, how this, the, the roles that are played, NGOs, uh, I think uh, the question was how the government comes in to help. And I just think that the, the very successful models of this kind of development and, and entrepreneurship is just coming together of the government, NGOs, private sector, very important. Private sector has to come to help, and also philanthropy. And I think private sector and philanthropy in, in Armenia needs a little bit more time in order to be there and arrive in order to, in order to be social minded. Um, I think uh, when you come to think, even in the US, um, when you look at examples of successful public-private partnership, I mean, when you build major infrastructure today, in California, you can't build the high-speed rail, which is just a system that is, you know, common in many places, because there's not enough government funding. And the only way that they're gonna do this is if they bring in private funding. So, so I think it's, the, it's coming together of this four, and in Armenia, we see the NGOs very active, and we see some government money sometimes, their matches, we know from our programs. But philanthropy and, and private sector still has to be coming. Do, do you see the government being more receptive to the NGOs, to the private sector being a partner with this new government in place? Uh, I don't know enough, and we, did, we haven't had enough time, but I know that there's a lot of and healthy NGOs that probably will play a part. So unfortunately, it's my least favorite time of the panel. I have one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So here we are at the Commission at the Status of Women. We've been attending for a number of years, and it's it's, it's great to be able to celebrate our successes and so ponder and talk about what we do going forward. In Armenia, for those of us who have been and even those who haven't, we're talking about raising the potential of women and girls. But my concern is, and I'd like if you can comment on it briefly, is in order for us to achieve equality in infrastructure and social protection, we need to also engage, I think, and educate the young boys. And, and, the, and it's the men and the mother-in-laws who are also holding their doors. <laughs> <laughs> Programs or ask 
for funding and partnering. We cannot leave the boys in the schools behind so that they accept that this is the norm. But this is the norm. So I, I just did not to Going to direct. I'm going to ask first. Ask the mic if you want to speak to some comments. Um, and then we'll yes, so very, very short remarks. My name is Julia Stefani, and I am a career member of Armenian Civil uh, Service since 2010, and I work in the Armenian uh, Mission to the United Nations. I just, uh, maybe a small positive use, if I may, <laughs> yes, on the side of the government. Um, first, uh, on the law on domestic violence, so okay. it's already one year we have it. Now it's uh, we're like reviewing the implementation uh, and um, elaborating you know, new approaches for interagency uh, coordination because uh, um, we studied a lot and we still study the experience of, the, uh, for example, EU member states, the most advanced ones. They had and they still have almost the same issues as we encounter today. So, but the law is in place; uh, it is being reformed. Uh, the referral mechanism, the whole infrastructure that uh, you know, the story requires uh, is, is being developed at the moment. Uh, on stand, you brought the example of uh, two more. If I may add also armored labs uh, mm -hmm. with the pretty big you know, girls' participation. The co-op center is for yeah. example, Lori, a number of others. And uh, last but not least, as a, uh, as a woman who also uh, choose uh, not traditional woman profession, uh, a diplomatic career which would require a lot of traveling, uh, a lot of sacrifice if I may say so, uh, especially if you have a family. I can say that, for example, uh, in my class, uh, vast majority were women. And the vast majority of those who applied and, and was accepted to foreign service were girls. So uh, nowadays, for example, in foreign ministry, uh, we have uh, gender parity, if not you know, more, uh, more women uh, than men. Thank you, Zoya, to thank Zoya, Nairi, Maria, and Anush for joining us here this evening and enlightening us all with your experiences and hopefully making clear that we all have a lot of work to do to participate in the development of Armenia. And so with that, we're going to wrap up this discussion. We all know that the work of Armenia Fund, the ARS, and the World Bank, it doesn't stop here. We see them in the trenches every day working toward the empowerment of women and girls through their multifaceted programs. We're honored to have the opportunity to have brought you all onto this panel and learn from your experiences. <coughs> we thank you all for coming and we hope you have a great day.